I gave it the, the title to attack but not to attack the Israeli dilemma. And it's, it's an effort to try to think, first to describe what has been going on in Israel, which has been very, very unusual, to some extent unprecedented in terms of public discussion of an issue. And, um, and that's the first slides about the post Iraq. And I'm, let's go to the next slides. There has been a very clear pattern that has dominated the Israeli code of conduct in this area for the last essentially 20 something years, more than 20 years, 30 years from the time of post Iraq. Essentially, the Israeli public has given on this existential slash nuclear area the right to deliberate, to decide, and to execute decisions. That right completely to the leaders, before the attack, or before the action, and after the action. This was the pattern in June 1981 when Israel attacked was Iraq. There was total <coughs> silence in terms of public, public, I mean there was some information about the Iraqi, what's Iraq reactor and the French connection with Iraq, not there. But it never came to a debate whether Israel should or should not the issue. Some people knew that there was some thought about it, but it was obvious and evident we are not going to discuss this issue. There was not even need. First, there was a great deal of operational secrecy. But even on the political issue, the issue has not been discussed. Even 10 years later, 1890, when it was became known that Iraq was building up again its program, program that was quite different from the one in, in uh, Ost Iraq, there was still no discussion this Israel. The question is whether or not Israel should attack. Even in the broad <coughs> political strategic sense, was not discussed. It was recognized in Israel, we do not discuss publicly this issue. We believe it, we leave this option to the leaders. Then of course, 2007 was the Israeli attack in Al-Kibar, Syria, which came as a total surprise. And as you know, to this very day, Israel has not acknowledged anything about it. That it all came from American sources, IEA, and so forth. So we are talking about change of, of, of patterns. I want to, re to remind people of the, the speech that Benatan Begin gave, a very emotional, to some extent, self-righteous speech that he gave in, immediately after the action of Surat. Maybe I'll not mention one interesting anecdote. The decision was, that was made among the people who were involved in that, we are not going to acknowledge after unless Iraq is going to have a full, elaborate statement on this matter. Iraq did not say a word. For 24 hours, there was no silence. Something came from Jordan. And Menachem Begin himself, he decided to overrule a decision that he was involved in making earlier. That is to say, to give a statement, essentially to give the, the, the Begin's doctrine in a very public fashion. And he put it in a way that he said it was going to be the obligation of any prime minister in the future to follow that kind of attitude, that kind of policy, the policy of preempting uh, the, the establishment of nuclear weapons facility or nuclear facilities towards nuclear weapons in foster states, and the commitment of Israel to take actions, including, it didn't say that, but essentially including given the risk of war. Uh, and he put it very much in the context of the Holocaust. This is exactly what he said in a very dramatic way. Ever since it's known as the Menachem Begin Doctrine. Now, there, was, there has been a great deal of talk about Iran in the last 10, 12 years. If you look at the Israeli papers from the mid 90s, they were saying in a few years, four years, five years, six years, Iran will almost have the bomb or will have the bomb. And that goes on and on and on. Today we are 2011. But the question is, under what circumstances, if Israel should have again accomplish, execute the Begin Doctrine, what essentially has not been discussed in any concrete terms. This was the old pattern has been, has been continued. And yet something happened in the last few months. And I'm going to give a little quick descriptive uh, story of what actually happened, the narrative of what happened. It started in June 2011, when the former chief of the Mossad, Mayor Dagan, resigned. And he did something quite unusual. He brought essentially a bus of journalists 
to the Mossad headquarters north of Tel Aviv to give them, those journalists, still in that office, under the Prime Minister office, to give them his philosophy about the future of Israel, the issue of Iran, and the kind of legacy that he left. So first he said that uh, he believes that the Iranian issue is going to remain essentially dormant. Uh, it has been set back until 2015. He said it just a few months ago. Then he said his view about military action. And this is really a quotation. He said, military action against Iran anytime soon is the silliest idea I have ever heard. Then he said that Israel should consider military action against Iran only and when the sword, this was the metaphor he was using, he was using it again, again, only when the sword is over its neck, the next of Israel. Only then <coughs> consideration for military actions are, are justified. And then he left, which was totally unprecedented, it, ons it kind of onslaught on, on both his boss, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and the Minister of Defense essentially saying, this too may be dangerous for the country. He was saying, when I was in job, and chief of staff, Gabi Ashkenazi was in job, and former military intelligence, General Hamas Yadli was in job, we were able to restrain these two adventurous men. Now I'm really afraid. The country was shocked, because when the former chief of Mossad essentially put those blames and those accusations on the leadership, the political elected leadership, this is quite unusual. And that unleashed something that was built up and yet was, was not ready to go out. That is to say, the beginning of some sort, starting with a whispering debate about the meaning of all that. Is it useful, not useful? Should Israel, should not Israel take actions against, against Iran? Let me mention a few interesting, which people who do not follow the, uh, the, uh, the Israeli press uh, are not fully aware of that. There was quite a few interesting things. Uh, Alouk Ben, who was now the editor of Chief in Haaretz, a personal friend, he for the first time, and this was allowed to pass the Israeli censorship, which is quite significant. As you know, in Israel there is this office of censorship that thinks that would harm national security, brings them into them and they can kill. They can make it not to be published. And in that case, he was saying actually, that General Ashkenazi, the former chief of staff who just left office about a year and a half ago, that actually he was sabotaging various kinds of instructions and guidance by the political level towards military actions against Iran, and using his authority, he made it much more difficult to be done. Essentially, he did not advance, he did not support the instruction that he got from his, from his commander. The language that Alouk Ben put in the press was quite unusual. Essentially, here's the chief of staff who is using his authority, something I'm using his authority, against those elected superiors. In September 2011, the correspondent for the Israeli TV, Alon Ben-Davi, he was, in a way that was clear that he was referring to some kind of specific event. And I made a few questions, and indeed, a few weeks ago, apparently there was some event either a rehearsal, that's my speculation, or possibly preparation, maybe even more than that, for flight, reconnaissance flight over Iran, but there was some sort of event that made some Israelis who knew about it very, very nervous. And it gave the impression that these two gentlemen, the Prime Minister of Netanyahu and the Minister of Defense, are really ready to carry out operation against Iran. And along with the big put it again, it's an op-ed piece in Haaretz. Uh, months later, October 2007, the UN <coughs> Israel public business, and it became clear that the issue is to get certain kind of understanding and clarifications about Israeli actions in Iran. He was saying some of that even in public. <coughs> and perhaps the most interesting thing came was when Hubal Mea, one of Israel's most leading journalists, in a headline, this was three weeks ago, in the author for not Friday, half a million copies circulation. He put it, Netanyahu and Barak pushing towards actions in Iran. And again, it was quite clear to people that it was based, it was based on something factual. He couldn't say exactly what, but it was based on something factual, and he wants the Israeli public to be aware of that. 
And after that, it was a flurry of conversation in the Israeli press, including to lead to the commander of the Air Force, that he's the one who should tell the truth, to the leaders not to take actions. And in return, there was ministers such as uh, Benny Begin, the son of Menachem Begin, who was minister of Iraq portfolio, but he's in the inner cabinet, and um, Dan Meridor, deputy prime minister in charge of atomic energy and intelligence. And they were talking about this incredible and unprecedented irresponsibility by discussing all that kind of things out loud in public. Arts came with a poll that was very interesting about what's got another thing which was quite unprecedented. What is the Israeli attitude about that? And it was interesting that about roughly half, half, half of the people, 39, were 41% um, of the Israelis were for action, 39 of the Israelis were against action. They didn't understand what the implications of action mean, that is to say, the original war, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Another element, and again we are trying to cover the lead, was the fact that the Israeli censor, who could have stopped and oppressed that kind of discussion, she kept, it's a woman who ran that office, she kept this, this attitude of let me even talk. And she stopped only some details, but she allowed that kind of stuff. This was unprecedented. Um, and then Ehud Barak, just about 10 days ago, he was talking about the irresponsibility of all these voices, especially those alarmist voices. And he was saying that some member of Knesset talks about 100,000 casualties in case of the war. And he said, not going to be 100,000, not 10,000. He said, not even 500. And he read <coughs> the first time he was using that his estimate, whatever it's going to be, if we come to that, which he said, I expect, I hope not, it will be even less than 500. But this was escalation, just escalation of this, of this war in words in the Israeli media and in Israeli public discourse, which was essentially breaking all previous national taboos. We don't have any of the uh, stuff here. <coughs> Because we had a very interesting piece of overview of that discussion for a minute, including reference to the missile test, including exercises of the Israeli Air Force west all the way to Italy. All of them gave some credibility <coughs> to the sense that something may get me going on and some kind of preparation. Um, I can cite from my own op ed just published an hour uh, a week ago. That I, I said that uh, if in the past there was a tactical agreement that the subject of this matter were not amenable to public discussion, and the military censor, aided by the media, enforced its silence, Israel today refuses to heed this old code. It appears that even the military censor refused to enforce the disciplined silence. Unlike the past, Israel public refuses to relay existential keys to just two persons, or even an inner cabinet of eight ministers. This is in itself, at least in my view, is a positive and stunningly unprecedented development, and it adds another restraint to a fragile system of check and balance. This was my own head. Uh, we have here a piece from Howard's of today, in the context of what Borak just said, and this is Yossi Benman, who talks about referring to Borak as delirious, quite unusual. So this is just covering the lay. And now let me go to the to the attack or not attack to the pro and cons. And I'm going to start first about the public, the public prison that Israel, Israeli leaders put in public. Actually the, the piece that we're going to have from El Barak, he just said it yesterday or the day before it came to Charlie Rose. And um, at the end of the talk I'm going to talk about what is non public part of the story, which is not being covered. First, there is the Holocaust outlook and the repeating, the, the vaguely thing that Israel would not allow anybody in the area to have weapons, that even if the likelihood of use is low, we are, cannot accept, we cannot tolerate situation that enemy of Israel, in particular country like Iran, which does not accept the legitimate Israel, will have such uh, weapons of mass destruction with that kind of magnitude. So the Holocaust outlook. Then, and again, Barack said it in, in his talk uh, in PBS, he was saying that nuclear Iran is going to be dramatically different 
politically, strategically, from everything that we know in the region. So the region is going to be dramatically by far more dangerous. And therefore, why Israel and the region, including the Arabs, cannot accept, cannot tolerate nuclear Iran. The other element was that Israel, given its geography, given its population, cannot live under a balance of terror. So even if it was, seems to be working during the Cold War under some kind of containment, perhaps that's the situation that they between India and Pakistan, the Israeli claim is that given the asymmetries of population and resources, this is the old reminder of what the President Rafsanjani of Iran said, that Israel is a one bomb country, in other words, and the entire future can be determined by one bomb. And then there was another argument which is common these days, theoretically but also politically, in the non-proliferation literature in our business, and I think that Bill's book was dealing with that kind of view, and this is the claim that as if Iran is going nuclear, there will be a cascade of proliferation, and the claims go to Saudi Arabia, to Egypt, and Turkey. Um, Barak did not use cascade, but he used exactly that argument in his previous argument. The whole Middle East is going to be proliferate, uh, proliferation is going to happen everywhere, we, it will be impossible. And of course the issue of nuclear terrorism. So these are the pros, we all know that, uh, Paris also mentioned that in, the next, in his own comment. Let me say something about the cons. This argument on the surface looks strong, but in fact they are significantly weaker if one interprets Iran the current policy of Iran, the way it seems to, to many of us. That is to say, Iran seems to be positioning itself very much on the proximity to the bomb, perhaps having all the components to build the bomb, that is to say, to utilize the full option, but not necessarily actually to produce uh, arsenal to adopt open nuclear posture and so forth. All indications are that if Iran is not going to be attacked, they would like to stay within the NPT. They do not want the, fact the, the sanctions to be even stronger than what they are today. And Iran would like perhaps the salami faction, the salami method to push towards the bomb, but not necessarily it seems that they do not want this to, cross, to cross the line. So this is what I call an Iranian variant of Israel's capacity. Israel, of course, does have the bomb in a packed way, in a non-acknowledged way. Iran under that it would be much more difficult to actually have the bomb. But to try to extract some deterrence, some influence, some prestige from having the bomb. Now this is very different mode of proliferation than the one that, that uh, uh, many people talk about nuclear Iran. Therefore the phrase nuclear Iran is very often big and, 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 and part of our job as, as people who study the subject is to try to be more explicit, more precise, what do we mean by that? I think that under the present circumstances, if Iran is not going to be attacked, the chances that Iran would go to the open mode are not very high. So under those circumstances, the, it's quite unlikely that all those predictions, and again, we can discuss it further in question and answer, but all those predictions about the cascade and about the the dramatic overnight changes in the politics of the region would happen. I think they are, they are overstatements. I think there are two allergies. That's at least my own view. And perhaps the most important thing is that the pro-argument looks even less compelling once one realizes that if and once Iran is attacked, it is the most likely thing that the attack on Iran would change Iran policy and would turn Iran into open posture, leaving the NPT, and all that kind of thing. In other words, there is a great chance that an action against Iran would cause the effect that it wants to, to, to prevent. And that's quite a compelling argument. That's actually, once you hear that, the arguments, the pro-arguments, get a great deal of, of, of shade at. Now I want to say a few words about the, um, the consequences of attack. Um, I said that it's likely to reverse Iranian attitude and trigger fundamental reversal in Iranian trading policy. It would increase Iranian determination attack. 
to, to resist the West, to resist the attack. And even, we just heard it a few days ago, even the opposition in Iran said that if Iran is going to be attacked, they are going to collapse behind the leadership. So again, we see that the uh, attack could be, in some respect, quite counterproductive. I want to move to the issue of the attack itself. Is it feasible and whether it's effective? And I want to say I'm not a military expert. I think I'm reading here and there a little bit about it. But I'm talking and trying to bring the views that I'm hearing from people who, who, who know about it. So there is the issue of the feasibility. And the common view is that whether it would be feasible for Israel to do, probably yes, with a great deal of difficulties and planning uh, in terms of geography, in terms of the routes. Any route has to go through territory which is not, which is not friendly to Israel. The southern route is Saudi Arabia. The mid route is Iraq and Jordan. The northern route is Syria. So Israel has to, to do a lot of great deal of, of preparatory action to do that, most likely you need some kind of uh, coordination with the United States, and the United States did control the sky over Iraq. Uh, the view whether it's too big for Israel, it's probably too feasible, but too big for Israel. And I can tell you that I have discussions with quite a number, obviously people today in Syria do not talk about it, but I have discussions about that in Israel with a number of one or two star general, the one star general, who served in the 80s and the 70s in the Israeli Air Force. And their view is it can be done, it will be stretching the Air Force to the limit in terms of number of sorties, in terms of duration, in terms of stability, but probably the project as a whole is too big for Israel. That's their common view. And again, these are people who are not privy to the classical material and all that. So whatever tricks there are at the moment I'm going, but one specific tricks, this big one of the world. But in general, the assessment of Military expertise, most likely it's a job that can be done, but probably too big for the Israeli army. Now, the question of the effectiveness, and again, there is some consideration into it, I'm not going to elaborate on it, there is the question of intelligence, obviously it can be effective only if you have timely and real intelligence, which is very, very hard, as you know, material can be removed in a day from facility to facility, from a task elsewhere, so you need to have very timely intelligence by hours. There is the question of the difficulty of destroying those deep underground targets. Uh, there was a story that came out that the United States just built a small number for its own arsenal of huge uh, bombs that can go deep, deep, tens of meters below, and about like 15 tons of bombs. And um, so there is like, the question of to what extent, even if you get down to in terms of feasibility, how effective it could be. And the views are the most optimist, maybe with a delay of two to three years. The more pessimist view is to make some damage, but not that significant, a matter of months. I don't have a view, I don't know that, I'm not a sensitive military expert, but my intuition is that probably it will be nine, six months, perhaps the next. So then the question is whether it's worth for that kind of delay to do. Now I want to, to mention a few words about the, what I call the unknown dimension, which I'm quite intrigued with that, including what uh, appears today. This is ours of today. This was a headline that came out in ours of today. Let me say a word of history. Sometimes when one side believes that they have some strategic advantage and the other side does not have it and it's time sensitive there could be a strong strategic incentive to go into action now because you may lose that kind of unique strategic advantage. This happened, and it was good, but this happened in World War I when the Germans started the whole mobilization trade system to give them a great kind of advantage, and they thought that advantage was going to work because it's, it would be very significant. It happened in Israel in 1981 when Israel was going into a full engagement with Syrian Air Force, Air Force, they were able to shut down more than 80 planes without losing one because they had a break, electronic breakthrough and they were able to, to jump the entire traffic and they took advantage of that. Some people said we must keep it for a future war, not for that kind of, of campaign, but it was used and Israel got did a great achievement. 
And I have suspicion, and this was the story that came out today, is just, just I personally know that a great deal of money is being invested in, in cyber, cyber warfare. And if one side believes that they are able to jam and to shut down the other side, maybe it can create a very strong incentive to take action. Maybe it's illusion. Maybe there is something illusionary about it. But my suspicion is that that may be part of, of the story. I think that Israel did put a lot, a lot of money into cyber warfare, and maybe some people say that this is the time to use it, and it would be waste, it would be, would be, would be uh, unfortunate just to keep those, those reserves. So this is the, I think this is one of the unknown dimensions which we can only speculate. Now I want to say something about the consequences of I think the consequence would be unprecedented and catastrophic. First, something, you know, a word about the war itself. A war with Iran would not be only a war with Iran. It would be a war in at least three frontiers, possibly four frontiers. That is to say, in addition to a traditional war with Iran, that could go weeks, maybe even months, and some studies came into years looking at the example at the president of the Iraq-Iraq war that took almost a decade. Uh, but it will have also will have Hezbollah in Lebanon, and as you know, Hezbollah has right now over 50,000 of all sorts of rockets, mostly short range, but not only short range, mid range and some long range cover entire Israel, 50,000, 100 long range, Hamas in, in Gaza, and possibly Syria. So the, 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 the amount of damage material to economy, not to talk about human price, would be huge, unprecedented. And when Barack just the other day said to his radio radio, I can assure you it's not going to be for two hours, that it's not going to be 500, he touched a very important point, but pointed a lot of people immediately questioning, because all these operational research studies that was done by, by so-called operational scientists, of course, you put assumptions and you get results, but if you put different assumptions, you get different results. So there was a great deal of skepticism about the number when you push, it's not going to be more than 500. And some of the numbers that are floating in Israel talks about thousands of cases. That would be unprecedented. Israel never, its rear never had that kind of damage in any of the war in the past. The only one that somewhat re related to that was the one with Hezbollah in 2006, when 40 or 50 people were killed, and it was continued for about three weeks, and thousands of rockets landed on Israel. That's going to be by far much more dangerous, much more devastating than what happened in 2006. Then there is the question of ter war termination. War like that can be dragged and to come to a situation in which you are able to impose on Iran stop and cease fire, it would be very, very difficult. Then there is the question of global terrorism. Iran has promised that if it's going to, the war is going to be unleashed in the Middle East, it's not going to be limited only to the Middle East. Then there is the issue of the world <coughs> global economy and the price of oil. And then there is the issue of the unification of the Iranian regime. And of course, in terms of Israeli-American relations, I think the American public, as uh, some of you may know, there was war game that was done at the Savant Center about a year ago. And within hours, it became clear to the participant of that war that the United States would get involved. That even if Israel started its own without any coordination with the United States, within hours, it became that the United States got involved. I think there will be a great deal of resentment in, the, in America about that kind of war. It's, you know, we had Iraq, we had Afghanistan, so we have another war right now. I think there will be a great deal of resentment, which ultimately would, would harm Israel. So there is, we're talking about region in Hamburg, perhaps even world in heaven. And this brings me to the issue of diplomacy. <clears throat> in this analysis, and again I'm trying to speak almost telegraphically, but this analysis suggests that from a rational point of view, I think it's, it's important to bring rational argument, the con argument seems to outweigh the pro argument in a very significant way. Reason appears to suggest it would be not be in Israel's interest to attack Iran. 
And given this, my conclusion is that much of the current Israeli talks and leaks about attacking Iran is in fact a sort of bluff. But if we think about bluffing, let's think about the logic of bluffing. In order for a bluff to be credible and effective, it must look credible, other must believe that it's credible, and you create a situation that you don't want other to call the bluff a bluff. And that under some circumstances, if the opponent calls the bluff, or if you come to a situation that you need to act, you may have to carry out the bluff, even if initially you didn't want to do it. So it is a very serious situation, even though I think that the number of interviewers here, I think personally that the chance of a bluff is perhaps 80%, I think it could be a situation that these two gentlemen, El Barak and Prime Minister Tanyano, will have to carry out the bluff. Uh, we do know part of the leaks that came to the Israeli press was that El Barak told his general, and apparently the Israeli military establishment is, a, is generally against taking that action. And he was telling them, this was a leak that again the censor did not prevent from, from being published. He was telling them, if we had generals like you in 1967, we wouldn't go to war, we wouldn't win. So it's a possible situation that you are the generals, you are the, the representative of caution. Israel, from his perspective, has lost its spirit of, of boldness and dare. And in a moment I'll, I'll come, back, come back to that. But uh, I suggest that a great deal of it is bluffing, but the bluffing has also some elements of truth, and under some circumstances, it could be, could be used. Now, what are the targets of bluffing? That's another tricky question. Well, the United States. But one question is to what extent, and if, the United States means on dealing with others, and others means American public, but even more so outside, members of the Security Council, in particular Russia and China, uh, to say and to use the Israeli law as a way to make pressure towards stronger sanctions and towards other kind of stronger action. Stronger action, not diplomatic, but short of military reaction. What we call dirty games, such as the Stuxnet, assassination, mysterious explosion and all sorts of things like that which are lost short of war but but at that level. Obviously the <coughs> the, the bluff is towards the member of the Security Council essentially telling them what do you want? You want regional war that will bring the war into havoc or more stronger sanctions to run? And it seems on the surface that their option should be forced or sanctions to have to run. Um, and of course, Iran itself in terms of getting Iran in a negotiation. I think that Iran is the least, by the way, to be affected by this kind of law. Let me go, time is running, and let me go to uh, final reflection. And I say that I believe that there is another element which is not public, but it's underlying, and it's a deep part of the discussion. And that's, and that's, Maybe I will start before that by saying that I face the paradox when I think about it. Because on one sense, and putting ideology aside, it seems that this reason almost compelling us to think that the consequences of war are much worse than containing Iran in a strong, committed way. It's, it's, it seems almost unquestionable. Unless there is some trick, that, and again, even with those, those tricks, nobody can guarantee for them. So it seems that reason almost compelled not to go to war against Iran. And yet the Israelis are very serious about it. Even the blog, but there is some element of truth in that blog. And I believe that behind that, there is one underlying issue, and that's the desire of the Israeli leadership to maintain or to keep or to shelter or to shield Israel's nuclear monopoly. I believe that the Israeli leadership believes that this aspect the monopoly is crucially important domestically but also outside in terms of independence of action, in terms of in particular for right-wing government that often and often say no to the world and defying the world, and they believe that there would be a great deal of difference between Israel with the bomb, alone with monopoly, and Israel sharing 
and getting into dangerous Middle East. I think that Israel, that, that without monopoly, that Iran has either close proximity to the bomb or perhaps even some small arsenal of the bomb, Israel would feel itself much, much weaker. And I think that the Neo and Barak, each were not necessarily exactly the same reason, but for some overlapping, are ready even to make a very credible threat of war in order to keep that kind of strategic effort. And that issue, unfortunately, is not part of the debate at all. To what extent that monopoly, from the Israeli perspective and from the world perspective, is the worst reason to go to war. So that's, broadly speaking, my, my, my outlook on, on this issue. 